Hi, this is Greg from Vegas. In this video and others, we'll take a look at interesting destinations and attractions that are just off the Vegas Strip. So call it within a 10 minute Uber ride. In today's video, we'll take a look at the Nevada Atomic Museum, which is part of the Smithsonian's network of museums. It's built on the legacy of the Nevada test site, where we did our above ground and below ground nuclear testing for several decades. So there's a lot of interesting material that they've assembled you know, in this destination. The Atomic Museum is an affiliate of the Smithsonian, which is the largest museum complex in the United States and is mostly known for its many individual museums in Washington, D.C. As a Smithsonian affiliate, the Atomic Museum gets access to national resources and support. Besides showing items from the Atomic Museum's in-house collections, there are exhibits that draw from other museums too, like the NSA's National Cryptologic Museum. Stick around to the end of the video when I'll share a couple of good restaurants that are literally across the street. When you first enter the museum, boom, you walk past an atomic bomb. How often do you get to do that when you walk in a room? It's a replica of the Fat Man atom bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki in Japan and accelerated the end of World War II. Alongside the bomb is a video monitor where you can see a brief video about the use of this bomb, what went into making it, and how severe its impact was. In describing how the bomb was detonated in the air rather than on impact to the ground, the video describes the blast radius, the various ranges of destructive power, including the level at which people were, quote, vaporized. In presenting this look at experiencing the Atomic Museum, we'll call out certain elements of how information is presented and exhibits are organized. These add a lot to the experience of going through the museum. You can have a very full two to three hour experience to take in its collection. When you buy your admission, you can also purchase the audio tour to get extra color commentary of the many exhibits. The audio descriptions include oral history materials from people who worked in the various areas, so this adds depth to the experience of seeing exhibits. After you get your ticket, most people will go through the rooms that are just off the entryway rather than going straight into the main collection. Who is really going to pass up on a theater name for Area 51, especially when there's a robot outside? Again, as you walk into this room, the first thing you see is a replica of an atomic bomb the one created by the Manhattan Project in New Mexico during World War II. While the subject matter covered in the Atomic Museum is obviously heavy, it is not an uptight, self-serious place. The museum as a whole commemorates the activities done at the Nevada test site about an hour outside of Las Vegas, where above and below ground atomic tests were conducted for 40 years. Part of that story is looking at the pre-World War II and World War II origins of atomic energy and weapons. One of the things that's very impressive about the exhibits in this room is how the information is organized. After all, the story of needing to create an atom bomb, assembling the cast of characters to do so, and getting it done took up a significant portion of the three-hour movie Oppenheimer. In journalism, clear articles convey the who, what, when, where, why, etc. of the given issue. Part of the ingenuity of the Trinity exhibit at the Atomic Museum is that it is organized into walls describing why, what, etc. Within that structure, people of all ages can follow along and choose which portions engage them the most. For example, on the Y column, there's a blown up replica of the letter written by Albert Einstein to President Roosevelt telling him about the Nazi atomic research and that the United States had to get ahead. There are also actual letters and cases written by Robert Oppenheimer, who ran the Manhattan Project. Something that lingered with me after seeing the Trinity exhibit was the What Now Wall, which describes the fallout field, the severity of radiation in relation to how far from ground zero. The displayed maps show the spread of radiation in the context of the state of New Mexico. With the Nevada test site, atmospheric, i.e. above ground tests like the Trinity explosion were conducted about 80 miles from Las Vegas. In 1962, the largest such test was conducted that was about five times the size of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. A week later, Frank Sinatra played this set list at the Sands Hotel. The Atomic Lounge and Gallery is another location for rotating exhibits. Currently, there's a fun one on espionage and spying, which is relevant since atomic secrets have always been a target of spy services, and the archetypal spy has always been James Bond. 
In this room, you hear the classic Bond theme music and see an interesting visual display dynamically presenting clips from various Bond films. In display cases, we see Bond-branded spy toys from the early 60s. So right next door to the serious historical presentation of the origins of atomic weapons, we can connect with how atomic issues permeated culture and entertainment. Besides dramatized espionage, this room has real deal espionage items from the NSA's National Cryptologic Museum in Maryland, including an actual Enigma machine used by the Germans in World War II for encoding their communications. And remember, you're under surveillance. Now let's go check out the main collections. As you walk into the entryway of the main museum, you get immediate context about the atomic activities that led to creating the museum. Almost 1,000 atomic tests were conducted at the Nevada test site from 1951 to 1992, above ground or atmospheric and below ground. The series of images showing the stages of the first atomic explosion conducted by the Manhattan Project immediately set the tone. Then you come to the set of three monitors that show clips from World War II and the Cold War. These include detonations that quickly give you historical context, which is helpful especially if you walk straight into the main exhibition area rather than passing through the room we saw earlier. As you move forward through the exhibit, you'll see timelines broken out by decade. These timelines are a model of good information design in that they clearly orient the reader placing the main sequence of events into historical context. You'll see the main timeline for nuclear testing events, framed above and below with world events and also popular culture. The timelines are large and easy to read. All museums would benefit from applying similar approaches to informing and educating their patrons. As you turn a corner, there's an alcove with a mural on one wall that explains the structure of an atom and on another, a short informational film from the 1950s about the applications of atomic energy. Something that began in the deepest recesses of national security research was very actively inserted into public discourse. Just beyond the alcove are displays showing how atomic energy showed up in popular culture and other ways. These exhibits rotate more frequently than the other displays. I went to the museum twice in two months and once saw this model from Ford for a concept car that would run on atomic energy, and previously saw a display of Area 51 uniform patches in the same case. Besides being mission control for all things alien from what we hear in the press, Area 51 is part of a bigger Air Force complex that is literally next to the Nevada test site. If they were states, they would have shared a common border and were maybe 10 to 30 miles apart. That Air Force complex is where Cold War spy planes like the U-2 and SR-71 Blackbird were tested. Current stealth aircraft came from the research and testing conducted at the Nevada Test and Training Ground. In the main display cabinet, you see the many ways atomic energy was presented in popular culture. Boy Scouts could get an atomic energy merit badge. There were atomic energy inspired drinks. Similar to a chemistry set, there was an atomic energy lab that came with uranium ore samples and would later be described as one of the most dangerous toys ever put on the market. The Columbia University Physics Department bought seven of these labs. In the area for atmospheric tests, you see the full expression of atomic and nuclear power. Images of the mushroom clouds, massive displays of ultimate destructive power, after tests were conducted in the South Pacific, negative feedback motivated the U.S. government to find a secret, visually secure location that eventually led to testing in Nevada. There's a quote from a general saying something to the effect that military service members who saw the mushroom clouds were expressing fearfulness, and that could lead to bad PR. Also, the Japanese complained about tuna being caught 100 miles away from South Pacific test sites and that it was leading to radioactive food being distributed in Japan. Something along the lines of, you know, the war has been over for a while. Do you mind not continuing to kill us? Then you'll come upon the Ground Zero Gallery. It is a concrete room, a bunker, where you can see a short film conveying a nuclear explosion we feel the rumbling and movement of air. It's a small way to time travel, but you do feel a weight, a sense of order of magnitude, by descending into a concrete space 
that you just wouldn't by watching an explosion on a modern flat panel TV on a wall as you chit chat about what to have for dinner. By now, you'll have noticed that we're presenting still images. The museum asks that attendees don't shoot video of the exhibits, so of course we're respecting that. Next, you move to the underground testing area by entering a simulated tunnel. Again, the museum gets big points for organizing their resources to construct an experience rather than just laying out a sequence of stuff. On the way into the underground testing area, you look down into a home bunker where people kept provisions for writing out what we would call today nuclear apocalypse. In the 1950s, bunkers were a type of home improvement in the early days of the atomic age. An aspirational purchase may be comparable to adding an infrared sauna room or deluxe home theater today. You then go down a slope into what feels and looks like a tunnel to explore underground testing. When it comes to the world of radiation, what is your go-to tool? Yep, the Geiger counter or a radiation detector. Any change in those values is something you want to know about N-O-W, now. Needless to say, there's a very substantial collection of radiation detectors. You'll notice that the detectors are in a case. The museum actually had a couple of detectors lining the walkway down into the underground testing area where you could physically touch them, grasp their handles, and point the wands. Of course, some loser that thought they were special ripped off the handles so they could show their low-life friends the souvenir and somehow prove they weren't a loser. Similar to the use of the informative wall boards in the Trinity exhibit near the museum entrance, there are wall boards for major nuclear research facilities like Los Alamos in Sandia National Laboratory in New Mexico. One thing that is interesting about the image of Los Alamos is seeing just how big of a site it is and how many buildings it has. When you go there, there is a single road going up into a mountainous forest and you'd have no idea just how expansive it is. As we move into the section of the museum called Stewards of the Land, we should think back to the statistics of almost 1,000 nuclear detonations happening at the Nevada test site. Its location is former Indian land, and you find yourself almost saying, of course, how else would we continue relating to local Indian populations than forcibly removing them from ancestral homelands and initiating nuclear explosions almost twice a month for 40 years? This section of the museum describes relating to the cleanup and the environmental aftermath. This is obviously an enormously important subject. I recently did a follow-up trip to the museum and learned something very interesting when I came through the Stewards of the Land exhibit. When I was doing my first draft of this review, I was going to criticize the museum pretty significantly about their previous handling of this section. It just wasn't at the level of the rest of the museum. It was well below par. The exhibits were very text dense, hard to read, and I think I actually used the phrase comparable to a good high school after school project or extra credit project. Not the case anymore. Someone came in, in the last couple of months and up leveled it. So the exhibits have the same well-organized set of materials, good graphic design. The content is easy to read. The rooms themselves flow much better. So there's been some physical reorganization. So I definitely came away understanding that the museum renews itself on a regular basis. On my first go through, I chatted with one of the docents and he said that they had like three times the square footage and storage of other materials. So even if you've been here before, it'll probably look different and you'll take away new insights and understandings and see new materials than you would have on the previous go-round. So well done, Atomic Museum. When we look back to the images of the most staggering mushroom clouds created when testing was done in the South Pacific, we see that they were created by hydrogen bombs, generating thermonuclear explosions. The museum has a model of a hydrogen bomb using the casing of a decommissioned bomb. The explosions made by hydrogen bombs were said to make the atom bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki look like firecrackers. 
There had been a total of 350 hydrogen bombs in the American arsenal until they started being decommissioned in 1987. However, 50 remained in service until 2011 when they were dismantled. The museum's thermonuclear bomb uses the casing of one of these. Across the board, the Atomic Museum is an excellent destination and institution. They present a very rich history in accessible, engaging ways. Also, the museum docents are incredibly knowledgeable, and some of them spent their professional careers working at the Nevada test site. Given that the museum is just a 10-minute Uber ride from the Las Vegas Strip, working it into your Las Vegas travel plans is worth considering. As I mentioned at the start of the video, here are two restaurant recommendations that are literally across the street from the museum. First, we have an Indian restaurant called Mint Indian Bistro, and then just up the street is a Thai restaurant called Lotus of Siam. They're both top-notch. I hope you have a great time the next time you come to Las Vegas.